Hey, hey, welcome back, everyone, to another broadcast of In the Trenches. I'm your host, Tom Morkis, and today I sit down with Steve Scott, who's the author of over 70 books and the creator of developgoodhabits.com and a number of other niche websites. And I brought Steve on today to talk about building wealth through digital products like ebooks and things like that. And I wanted to get his insights into self publishing primarily because he's written and published so many books. And you're going to hear it today that he's generating anywhere from thirty to forty thousand dollars a month just from books on Amazon. And I wanted to understand how he got there. What did it take to get there? And what is he doing to kind of grow that that whole space? Like what's working, what's not in the self-publishing space? Are audible books and audiobooks the way to go still? Are there any new tips, tricks, or strategies to get started if maybe you are inclined to write or publish your first book? And ultimately, just what is the opportunity for somebody who's interested in self-publishing? And is this still a space that can be profitable for somebody who's just starting? And I, my big takeaway from today's conversation is the answer is yes. It just depends how you approach it. So take out your pen and paper. And without further ado, let's get to today's conversation. So Steve, the thing I wanted to talk to you about today initially was about this idea of self-publishing, kind of how you go about self-publishing, because I know you've been really successful in that space and that realm. And it's not as easy, it's easier said than done. And I think anybody who's tried to go down that route has experienced that. It's like, oh yeah, you can create a book and sell it. And it's, it's easy because there's no overhead, but it's really, really hard actually to get any kind of enough, we'll say traffic or that, that critical mass of people to pay attention and purchase it to make much money off of it. But you are one of, I think, the exemplary people who has done just that across, I think, uh, several different niches. So I want to kind of explore that and broadly speaking, how you've developed different types of like passive income or just income streams online. Because you, I think, you, you know, you're a prolific blogger as well. But before, I guess, we get into those areas, how'd you get into this world in the first place? Well, I'll, I'll keep it brief because I, I definitely want to get to the meat of the topic. But the simple answer is I originally got into self-publishing because I was a blogger at first. And I saw myself writing posts after posts and actually went as far as writing a blog post one day, every day for an entire year. So I kind of definitely built that habit of writing every single day. But I wasn't seeing the traction on the blog like I would with um, other online income sources. So I I decided to try self-publishing on a lark. I put a couple of uh, blog posts together, threw it up on Amazon. And this is back in 2012. You could do a lot. It was a lot easier to publish stuff on Amazon.com. But when I put these um, blog posts together, I noticed that the books started taking off. And I just did a quick calculation that, hey, if I just put the same amount of effort that I did in my blog post and just picked a pretty tightly focused topic for each book and just published like I would on a blog, I could probably make some decent money. So in the fall of 2012, I decided to really just dive in and just do this full time as much as possible for an entire year and see what happens. And as they say, the rest is history. I just started seeing instant results almost in uh, the late fall and then uh, 2013 and then for 2014 is when things are really taking off for me. So that's a kind of really, really brief version. Yeah, no, no. I, and I appreciate that because I, I do want to kind of dig into that. When you got started in that space, you said you got results relatively quickly when you actually did start to self-publish. What were the things that like worked for you, we'll say back then, 2013, 2014, and how has the landscape changed in your opinion in 2018? Well, I think if I could um, be a little bit self-congratulatory, the, the one thing I did fairly well back then is I had a fairly loyal group of people who followed my blog and I had the email list already established. So really my model was to use the KDP five free days. So that's the old um, give away your book for five days, ask for a bunch of reviews, and then when it goes full price, when you switch it on to full price, you can get a lot of sales, almost like a, a momentum thing going on with Amazon. Now, Amazon has changed the rules. Um, they've changed like, they've changed a bunch of things in the last, I'd say, six years. But that was something that you could do then. And really, my model has pretty much been the same ever since. But with the one small change, instead of giving away for free, I just discounted to 99 cents. Same thing. I try to get as many people that follow me as possible to leave reviews. And then when it goes up to full price, there's a little bit of momentum. But the one kind of new wrinkle that I've added to my strategy is to rely heavily on Amazon marketing services, the ad platform that Amazon offers. And that's been kind of a game changer lately is being, being able to target specific books of specific keywords, titles, and authors of people that, that readers are looking for on Amazon and just present my book as a possible alternative to what they're already looking for. Well, on that front, I'm curious how effective is that? I mean, the way you described it sounds like it is effective. I've always been on the mindset, and I say this with an asterisk saying, I haven't really gone down the rabbit hole of 
paid advertising for books, but have dabbled in it a little, little bit, dabbled in AMS for sure. But I've never, I feel like I have yet to really find enough margin to make the advertising like truly worthwhile. Like maybe I might make a slight profit, but it's not, not like what I could with maybe like a, a higher price digital product or service offer or something like that. And so I'm kind of like, I don't really, I don't know. What's, what's your, been your experience with the paid advertising front? Like, is it, can it actually be done profitably? Yes, absolutely. Now there is a 80% of your results come from 20% of your efforts. So I found that there's only a couple of titles that it really takes off. And it's just a simple matter, not simple matter, but it's just a matter of just going out and finding a volume of keywords. So some of my best books, I have upwards of four or 5,000 keywords. And it really is seeing books that are coming out every single day, writing down the author name, writing down the title name, throwing them into AMS and just almost as a pure volume sake, seeing how your book converts for those particular keywords. And I found that there's some random book titles and random authors that a couple of my books have done really well for and just pretty much testing the hell out of, of everything that you throw up on Amazon. Now there's a couple of slow burners, ones that, you know, I'll make a thousand or two thousand dollars a month. They're not a huge success, but they are definitely part of a portfolio business. And that really is what my business is. It's a portfolio of books. I'm not trying to go out there and market one book and build a whole back end on it, which I'm, I'm sure you've had other people on your podcast that talk about doing that. Yeah, definitely. And that's why it's, I think it's kind of interesting to talk to you about this because a lot of times we do come at it from like the authority standpoint. So it's like a person with a single book or a couple books or something like that. And the, the, a lot of their profit is on the back end through coaching or service offers and things like that. But with you, it's you're making your money from the books themselves. And how many books, I don't know if you share this number, how many books do you have you published? Like how many are out there that people can purchase? I'm at the point I have about, I want to say 73 books a number of them, like I had a whole side project I started in 2013 that went nowhere. Now it's like 14 books. And there's a couple of the early books I had that basically talk about internet marketing that really just are severely outdated at this point. But I would say in my habit book line, I think I'm almost at 30 books at this point. And that's kind of the brand that I've been building since early 2014, 2000, late 2013. Got it. So like a, essentially a brand around habit and habit formation, right? Yes. Okay. And so maybe give some context like with where you're at right now or with what you've been able to kind of by publishing that volume of books and by doing what you're doing, what's like a typical month for you? Or if you don't want to share specific revenue, I'm curious, like, like low end, high end, kind of what are some of the numbers you've achieved? So people have like a reference point for this. The highest mark I've ever achieved, and this was actually almost exactly a year ago, I did achieve a hundred thousand in one month. That was just a number of fortunate things that happened, including, which is really unfortunately not a thing anymore but I had a couple books take off on the ACX platform and that is a audible platform. And they profiled one of the books I wrote with Barry Davenport to clutter your mind. For some odd reason, ACX decided to profile that book amongst its other like top five selections out of all of audible. So I got a ton of sales in a couple of months span and I got a ton of bounties two months later and the bounties are $50 per download within, I think if, it, if it's a person's first book that they read within 60 days, you get $50. Now I say, it's unfortunate because ACX just changed their platform where if someone randomly downloads your book as their first purchase, you don't get that bounty anymore. You have to specifically drive traffic to it. So it hurt a lot of authors, uh, myself included. So I would say right now, averaging, I would say 30 to 40, and that's really a rough, a rough guess a month just from self-publishing. So still pretty good, but I would say at this point, my overhead is pretty significant as well, where I'm spending upwards of $10,000 on AMS ads. So still a pretty solid source of income, but I've also dived into other online sources of income because with Amazon, with Google, with Facebook, you never know what rules are going to change. So you can't just rely on one source of income because it'll just go away overnight and you really have no control over it. Yeah. Still, those numbers are wild. Even if that was just a one-time thing, that's just impressive. And then the consistent numbers are well, mind blowing, I'm sure for most people who are listening to something like this. And so it's, that's remarkable, man. Like it takes a lot to get there. And I think the fact that you're experimenting with different ways of generating traffic and sales of your books is pretty interesting and, and tapping into AMS and, and things like that. I'm curious on the, on the audible front, is that something that obviously worked really well for you last year in that, that context? And now that kind of, uh, that opportunity is kind of gone. The one you just mentioned described, are you still like, are you still long on audible? And is that something where you're moving a lot of your books over to? or at least uh, including an audio version of him? I'll give you the perfectly honest answer right now. I don't know. 
I still think Audible, uh, not Audible, I think audiobooks is still the future. I still think a lot of people are going to be listening to audiobooks over reading books or even Kindle books, that sort of thing. I just think that it is a platform that's emerging. My hesitation is just the, with the ACX platform as a whole, it just seems to me that they're taking away a lot of what made the platform initially attractive. And one of the things about Audible is they require some sort of ridiculous contract. It's, I think it's seven years if you want to receive just 40% of the sales, like a seven-year contract, which is just ridiculous at this point, especially for how little they seem to be giving back. So for now, in the past, I used to always just publish an audiobook instantly. As soon as I put an ebook out there, I try to get the audiobook out there as, as quick as possible. Now it's changed a little bit because it does cost me a couple thousand dollars to produce an audiobook. So I'm starting to just wait, see how the book does. And then if it starts to take off, then I'll start to think if I should do an audiobook or not. And I know there are other audiobook platforms that are merging out there, but I, me as a personal preference, I like to see how other people do and then try it myself. I'm kind of lazy with that. I'd, I'd rather have everyone else make mistakes and just learn from, from their efforts. Yeah, I'm with you on that one, 100%. I'm curious. So do you think then, in your opinion, the way you kind of approach this then is how are book sales doing and then develop an audio book based on the ones that are performing? So then in your opinion, is it is there a direct correlation between interest for an ebook or a book on Amazon and the same demand on Audible? Or have you ever found or, or noticed anything where maybe a specific type of book on Audible will be more successful than it's like, digital, it's ebook or, or physical book counterpart? Almost without fail, I've seen a direct correlation between how a book performs on the Kindle platform slash CreateSpace platform, which is actually now being bundled back into uh, Kindle. So the print and ebook version, I've seen a direct correlation with audiobooks. So if a book's doing well on those platforms, invariably it'll do well on the audiobook platform and vice versa. So the books have, that have taken off on audio are the books that have, that have done well, the print version or ebook version. So I would say without a doubt, there is a correlation. And it just goes back to, does the title hook people? Does the cover track of its product description well-written? Is um, How are the reviews? That sort of thing. Like all, all kind of the fundamentals of sale publishing. And you, you've done like a, you do a volume play with this, which is so interesting and really compelling to me. Like, so when you approach something like this creating, and you said with say, let's talk about like the habit brand that you've created and written about, I think you said 34 books in that space. How do you approach each book? And how long does it take you? Give us like a behind the scenes of like, what does it take to develop the idea or from idea to the thing is out there and selling? Like take us through your process. Okay, that's it's a pretty lengthy process, but um, it used to take me about three to four weeks to get go from idea to publishing something on Amazon. I'm now a lot slower. And the reason I'm a lot slower is I like to do a lot more research, make sure that the content is top notch. And I'm working a lot more with writing partners. And to be perfectly honest, a lot of the books have taken off now were written primarily by Barry Davenport. And she and I have collaborated on a number, number of books. And a lot of times I'll do the outlining and the research or she'll do, one of us will handle the outline and the research. We'll send it back to the other person. And it's more of a back and forth type of um, operation. So just by the nature of working with somebody else, it, it sometimes will take upwards of two to three months. So as a, for instance, right now, there are three different outlines that are in the hands of other people writing it. But it took me, I would say two, three weeks to do each outline and my outlines are getting to the point where they're 10 to 15,000 words. So we're talking pretty meaty outlines and then they just turn the content into a final kind of polished version and I'll take it and do the final version, upload, do the whole back end of uploading to Amazon, setting up the promotional campaigns and then ultimately running the AMS ads. And I guess it really, it's depending on, it really all depends on kind of what I do best and what the writers do best. And just for certain topics, I know that I can pretty much write a book and get it into market. Whereas some books like what Barry writes, I know she, she's better knowledge expert than I am. So it kind of, it's another one of those, it depends type of scenario, but um, it really is just a matter of kind of, uh, I'm kind of rambling here. Uh, so I'll, I'll let you just jump in and I'll, I can probably ask more specific questions. Yeah, no, no, no. This, this is really interesting. But that's why I'm not interjecting because I am I am curious about your process. And I thought that was actually a really good rapid overview of what it, what it looks like. And now it sounds like a big part of what you do. And this hasn't always been the case, right? Where you're teaming up with other authors? Uh, yes, yeah, so that's more of a recent development in the last two years. A couple of years ago, and that's why I was rambling. It was a very clean cut process. I would, I would think about a book idea. I would have actually, I would keep a whole idea garden. I'd have a bunch of book ideas. I would decide, all right, what should I write about next? And often I would just pull my email list and say, of these three topics, which one do you like best? 
And then I would do a little bit of research on Amazon to see if related topics are selling well. And that kind of goes down to the ASBR rule, the Amazon bestsellers ranking. And if I found the top, a bunch of books with that particular topic, if it was under the number 30,000 or less, I knew it was selling at least a couple copies a day. I was pretty confident that if I wrote a book about that particular subject, I could just get it out there. So now it's more of a, I still do that, but also a lot of times I'm just trying to find something that I'm personally interested in or the co-author, if they're personally interested in, if they could provide a lot of value. How do you decide on a co-author? I'm curious. And you mentioned one person. Is that, and you, you've written a few books with her, I think. Is that the only person you're working with? Or is this actually like a strategy you're looking to do more of, like connect with other potential co-authors? And if so, like, what do you look for? I really have no process for finding co-authors. It's, it really was like who approached me. Right now, I'm working with Barry Davenport, who I talked about before. And like, honestly, the books that she and I wrote together are, are probably the best that I've seen with a couple of exceptions on Amazon. So I really like working with her because not only does she provide great content, but I know our books sell. I'm also writing books with uh, Rebecca Livermore. And we're, it's kind of the different aspects of my personality. So with Barry, it's more just about mindfulness and gratitude and that sort of thing. But with Rebecca, it's more like the daily kind of money habits and just running your life as a business. If I could describe a broad overview of that. And I'm experimenting with a couple of books with Jonathan Green, who I think you and I both met in um, Traffic and Conversion yep. a year or two ago. And he's kind of like, I've, I'm only working on the second book with him. And our first one was Complete Disaster. So sometimes my process like blows up in my face and I don't even make my money back. So it really is just, I'll try one book at a time and see what happens. And it's not really a specific, detailed strategy, but it seems to work for me. Interesting. Well, I'm so curious about this because, and you do, or do you do most of the writing yourself? It really is a mix and it, it's book specific. So like I mentioned before, with the mindfulness stuff, it's mostly Barry that writes it. She even does the outline and I'll kind of chime in a little bit, but my job is more of a marketing person than a writer. But with a lot of the books I write with Rebecca, it's almost a 50-50 split in writing. And then Jonathan, the first book was about how to quit smoking. And I had no experience with smoking at all. So I kind of let him run with it. And I thought the book was going to sell well. And he thought the book was going to sell well just for some reason. It just didn't. And I guess the quickest answer to what you just said is how close is the topic to what I go through on a daily basis? The closer it is, the more I feel like I can add value. But if it's something I don't know a lot about, only just a little bit, I just rely on the other person to write what they know about. And maybe I'll do help with some of the research and some of the kind of finding some of the scientific studies and that sort of thing to add a little bit more uh, depth to it. Well, it seems to me too, with the speed with which you're able to get these things out there, like a, an opportunity, not that it's necessarily something you want to pursue, because I know we were talking offline how busy you are already with all things considered. But I think to myself, I'm like, well, there's definitely trends, right? And there are things that trend. And if you're able to produce something quickly and of, you know, at least average or above average quality, it seems like you can kind of like create a, a nice position in the marketplace in the Amazon. And I think of myself, something like Bitcoin or cryptocurrency or what is the new, new hot stuff is like micro dosing uh, mushrooms and all this crazy stuff. If you just, you know, there's just all, all these weird trends that are happening. Like I feel like if you had your ear to the grindstone, you were just listening to what conversations are playing out in different spaces, you'd be able to pick up on those and then potentially produce something quickly. Has that ever been something you've considered or? As much as I like that idea, and it definitely works. I've seen it work on Amazon plenty of times. I don't like to approach topics where I have zero, zero clue. So for instance, like you mentioned, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, I invested $5,000 in Bitcoin and it promptly went down the next day. So I've lost 50% of what I invested. So I guess that's more from a personal standpoint, but there are certain topics I just, I know I shouldn't touch because I just don't have the experience. That said, if, if someone has a topic that can be turned into a habit and I feel like I can add to it, then that might be something that, that might be worth doing. But I guess to simplify my response, for me, I prefer evergreen topics because I know that, you know, if someone wants to lose weight right now, their odds are hundreds of generations from now, there's still humanity around. There'll probably still be people that are worried about losing weight. So I'd rather stick to the topics I know that they'll probably be buying in a few years instead of putting my time and energy into something that might not be popular in a year from now. That's my personal preference, but I definitely see there's lots of room for people using politics for as an example. There are lots of people who probably can sell the hell out of books if they have one viewpoint about politics. They'll get their haters, but they'll probably sell a lot of copies as well. And so I know we're coming up, I know you have a hard stop on this, on, on today's conversation. And, and I want to be respectful of that. And my last couple questions are kind of on this topic of, well, one, I guess is, do you sell courses or things other than eBooks and audiobooks? 
I did um, actually sold a whole publishing course that we put a lot of time and energy and actually that was working with Barry Davenport and uh, Ron Clendenin. The publishing course is still out there. I just decided to take a step back. I act as more of an advisor and once in a while I'll come and I'll create a couple of videos about what I'm currently doing. But I just found on a personal level, I just didn't like trying to sell the course. I didn't like doing webinars. I love the people I was working with. Just what I was doing every single day seemed to be taking me farther and farther away of what I enjoyed, which was self-publishing, which was building websites. It was more of a, look, like I just didn't like being turned into, let's talk about how to make money. I'd rather just go out there and build the businesses and not really talk about that. Um, I still think it, the, the course has value. I just, I'm not that part of it anymore. Got it. And then we were talking a little bit offline, like kind of where this is, where this is going for you or kind of what you want to do next. I know you, you are not quite sure, but I guess with based on what you're doing in the self-publishing space and that being of kind of keen interest to you or, or that you really enjoy the self-publishing process, sounds like like kind of the creation, the writing, the publishing piece of it. With where you're going from here, you have like this, so it sounds like this amazing baseline of income that's coming in relatively consistently. I'm sure there's ups and downs as with anything, but that has to give you a lot of like breathing room to explore different options. And I think what's cool is you tested out the e-course and it didn't really feel right for you to be like marketing and selling it, which I can I can relate to. I think a lot of people can. So in terms of kind of like where you're where you're based right now, or you're stationed like with uh, in relative to kind of what you've already produced and what's available for you to pursue, where are you inclined to go next? Where does it look like for you? Does it, does it include continuing to write and self-publish? Does it include a partner up with authors? Like what's next for you? I still think a large part of what I'm going to be doing is self-publishing. How I go about doing it is probably going to change. And I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to wrap my head around is I want to actually create some sort of authority website, some sort of authority brand that really focuses on one topic. And I feel while I've done a good job of, of providing a bunch of different books that people can enjoy, I want to find some sort of passion that people are truly interested in and build a whole brand around that. And that's a really kind of a vague answer. And that's what I'm trying to figure out right now. And like you mentioned, you and I were chatting beforehand. It's the whole, what do I want to be when I grow up? So I enjoy this business. I think self-publishing is great. And I, I also do some limited authority site uh, blogging type of thing where I make money outside of self-publishing. But I feel that there isn't some sort of over-encompassing goal behind it. It's more just kind of reacting to, to the whims of the day where I'd rather build something that will stand the test of time, almost like a legacy type of business. So right now I'm trying to journal, I'm trying to figure out different areas of my life of what type of product I can put out there that is a good free content website, free content podcast, but also makes money beyond self-publishing. I know, again, yet again, I'm kind of rambling, but it's kind of the byproduct of me spending the last two months on vacation, writing all this random thoughts down without really coming up to an absolute conclusion of what I want to do. Hey, man. Well, that's, I knew it was going to be a kind of a trick question there because we did kind of explore this a little bit. I was curious, just dovetailing off of like what we had just talked about. But I, I guess I'm, I'm, this is really fascinating to me, kind of like what you've been able to build in the self-publishing space and kind of the platform you have. And I think it is, it's kind of a breath of fresh air to see somebody who's like doing the work and getting these like really incredible results, not necessarily somebody who's just like teaching it per se, which there's nothing wrong with that, of course, but like actually doing it and still getting results. And in a space where I feel like sometimes I'm like, oh man, you know, and maybe this is just a natural inclination to say, oh man, I will, I miss that trend or I miss that opportunity. It's like almost like too late for Kindle because that decade or that was like five years ago is when it was prime or webinars or whatever it is. I always kind of feel that way. And then people like you have done these amazing things and have continued to do amazing things and prove to me that it's like, no, 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 these things aren't dead at all. And in fact, there's still a lot of life left in them, but it's how you approach it. It's what you're doing in the space that really matters. I don't know if you have any thoughts or feedback on that. Absolutely. I, I see examples every day of people who are crushing it in almost every type of online business model. I still see people that are doing extremely well that just started within the last year or two with self-publishing. I still, people do it, see, still see people doing well with podcasting and with building authority sites. And I don't know a lot of people are doing like physical products, um, merch. I, I'm just like pulling ideas out of, out of my butt. But there, I've seen plenty of examples of people who are crushing it in various niches. It's just a matter of I guess, finding who is doing really well and trying to figure out exactly what, how they're going about doing their business model. But there's still plenty of opportunities all over the internet with all over, with all different types of online businesses. 
Yeah. And it's just, it's got to feel good, I guess, to have a nice solid base and, and some aspect of that right now for you. So, and again, I appreciate your insights into this. Let me ask you this one question before we close out. What advice would you have for somebody's interest in, in self-publishing now? Like what are like one or two, or what's the critical thing that they need to do right in this day and age to get something out there and for it to generate like real profit for them, like now and in the future? I would say, um, the best advice I can give is one that I didn't create, but, uh, there's an author named Chris Fox, and he's mostly talking about fiction writing, but I think it can be applied to nonfiction as well, and that's just simply write to market. So his whole thing was uh, find a genre that does really well, uh, find out exactly what the tropes are for that particular market, and just write to market. Find out what people like and provide that type of value to them. And I would say that works as well with nonfiction. So find out what's selling, go on Amazon, poke around, look at the Amazon bestsellers ranking, find the topics that you see again and again are selling really well, and write to that particular market. But I would put a little bit of a caveat to that. So I would make sure that this is, you have to have some interest in it. And when I created my course, I, I created what was called the three P's of self-publishing. So I'll make sure that not only is it profitable, but you also want to make sure that you have some passion. So make sure that there, you have some interest in it because if you're writing about something that you hate every single day, it's going to become a grind really quickly, but also make sure you have some personal experience with it. So if you have a background, in it, uh, that's great. Just start writing about that. But if you don't have any background, really take the time to learn this market in and out. Talk to every knowledge expert you can track down and become an authority on this subject. And even if you don't know a ton about that market, find maybe the holes where you have some experience and learn all you can about that particular market and just write as good of a possible book, uh, write as good of a book as you can. And would you say part of that too is, I don't know if you, you mentioned this, but like what's in that space, maybe reading their books and things like that. I'm curious your perspective on that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a kind of no-brainer. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You definitely want to read every book that's under the subject. And I find just even looking at blog posts and podcasts, just try to cast as wide a net as possible. And I've done this with a number of markets, even just for as a personal example, when I got into real estate, I tried to read every book on the subject, listen to a dozens of podcasts, uh, and really just immerse myself in the topic. And you'd be surprised after absorb, uh, just pretty much surrounding yourself with the information over a span of a couple months, you really start to learn everything. And obviously the best teacher is personal experience go out and apply what you've learned. But yeah, absolutely. Read other books, do everything you can to learn as, as much as you can about the market. I love it because I feel like that's something anybody could listen to this and actually do even as like a side hustle to start out, to test something out. This is like, again, I, that's how I got my start was writing self-publishing, ended up starting a, a publishing imprint, publishing company and publishing other people's books. But I did it because I was like, this is the lowest overhead way to start a business, which is by writing. So if you have a, if you're a decent writer and you're willing to put in some hours to research and put these things together and you know, it's like, it's possible. You know, all of a sudden you could be making some extra income on the side and that's not bad. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if you have a, a daily commute or you exercise or anything, listen to an audiobook, listen to a podcast. You have probably easily an hour, two hours a day to learn stuff. And that's honestly how I learned self-publishing. I downloaded every everything I could about self-publishing. I just learned as I was running or learned as I was driving. And within a couple of months, I really felt that like I had a pretty solid fundamental understanding of how this industry worked. And then I just, it was a matter of just going out there and applying what I've learned. I love it. Well, Steve, thank you so much for being on In the Trenches. Where can people reach out to find you, connect with you, or learn more about the work you're doing? I'm just going to keep this simple. I'm just, just email me. I'm at the point that I have so many different websites and irons in the fire. So if you have a specific question, just email me directly at Steve Scott site at gmail.com. And I really should update that email address because that was about two sites ago, two websites ago, but uh, Steve Scott site at gmail.com. Hey, I love it. Well, Steve, thank you so much for being on in the trenches, man. It was a pleasure. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me on. And that wraps up another broadcast of in the trenches. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please do me a favor and go to tomworkus.com slash iTunes. That's T O M. M-O-R-K-E-S dot com slash iTunes and leave a rating and review for In the Trenches. Not only do I read and appreciate every review, but it helps spread the word of this podcast and allows me to continue to get on great guests. So thank you for your support and I'll